Okay, in the second video, I'm just going to do another projectile problem. This time, I'm going to deal with a cannonball that's fired at 100 meters per second uh, at an angle of 40 degrees above the horizontal. So this is 40 degrees, and this is 100 meters per second. And we're going to imagine this cannonball is going to come all the way up and come and land some, some part further away. Assuming the cannonball returns to the same height, so we're assuming that there's no height difference. This is a perfectly flat ground. Determine the horizontal range. So that'll be delta D in the eight in the horizontal direction. So that's one thing I want to know. And the impact velocity of the cannon. So when it comes back in, how fast is it going? I'm going to focus on the horizontal range first, and then I'll come back and discuss the impact velocity. in the vertical direction and the horizontal direction. In the vertical direction, I start with my acceleration of negative 9.8 meters per second squared. One more time, we're assuming that gravity is the only force acting on this object, and if that's true, then um, that, that would be its acceleration. And here in the horizontal direction, we're dealing with an acceleration of zero. Again, no horizontal significant forces. We're doing an, dealing with an initial velocity, and we'll have an initial velocity in this direction. And just let me pause and go back up and find that so that I can keep going here. I said I was going at 100 meters per second, 40 degrees above the horizontal. This is my opposite side, which means it's my sine side. So this is going to be 100 meters per second sine 40 if you're having trouble seeing how I got to that 100 sine 40 you should go back and look at earlier videos related to how to use the component method this is my adjacent side, which means it goes with my cosine ratio, and I can jump to the 100 meters per second, cos 40. Which would be 76.6 meters per second. So what that means is that in the horizontal direction, I start with a speed of 76.6 meters per second. And in the vertical direction, I start with a speed of 64.3 meters per second. So there we go. We've got some given information. There's one more piece of it, given information, that might be a little hard to see. It's easy to look at the fact that this object is moving through the air and forget the fact that at least from a vertical perspective and vertical only, it's going all the way up and coming back down to the same place it left from. So the actual displacement in the vertical direction is zero. It hasn't, from a vertical perspective, moved to a new position. It went way over horizontally, but since it went up and came back down, vertically it's at the same location. So with these three in mind, just like I did in the previous, I can recognize that the time that it's in the air is the same for both. So if I can find the time using those three variables, then I can apply that time to the horizontal direction. I'll use the equation here that delta D is equal to V1T plus one half acceleration time squared. That's a D. So here my displacement of zero, 64.3 meters per second T plus one half times negative 9.8 t squared. Now one half of negative 9.8, I can do that right here, negative 4.9 meters per second squared t squared, 64. I'm just writing this out now, I'm not doing anything new. And I've got a quadratic here, it's a little bit I'm going to be very formal with it, although I don't think it's totally necessary. I'll factor out a t, leaving me with 64.3 meters per second 
minus 4.9 meters per second squared, t. And all I did was take a t out of both terms. That way I have two, the two factors that make up this quadratic. I can say that they're equal to zero. And here, this factor, we can think of as that's when the cannonball was launched initially. Since we're interested in where it is finally, that's not an interesting route to us. So we're going to be working with this factor here. First thing, if I bring the 64.3 to the other side, then divide both sides by negative 4.9, I can come up with the time of flight. Thirteen point one. There's more, I'm just rounding. So that's how long this cannonball is in the air, 13.1 seconds. Again, just to reiterate the point here, I had this root t equals zero. If I go up to my diagram, we can see that, yep, the cannonball was at the ground at t equals zero, but it's going to come up all the way. And what we're really interested in, what's happening over here, and we just came up with that time at 13.1 seconds. Okay, so now I can add that time to my horizontal direction, and then I can solve for my displacement in the horizontal direction. Here I'm going to use that same equation, displacement equals v1t plus one-half at squared. This is a little unnecessary. This is uniform motion. I could use the simplified equation, but I use the, the bigger one just to avoid making mistakes. 76.6 meters per second times a time of 13.1 seconds. And since my acceleration is zero, this whole term goes to zero, and I don't have to worry about it. So all I have to do here is multiply that by my 76.6, which works out to 1,005 meters. This cannonball was going pretty fast, so it's landing pretty darn far away. So it shoots out of the cannon really fast and comes all the way back down here and lands 1,005 meters away, which is essentially a kilometer. It's going pretty darn fast in the first place. Now, the impact velocity. There's a really short and easy answer to this question, but I'm going to prove it mathematically just to be complete. Since this object is returning to the same height that it left from, any acceleration it does to slow down on the way up, it will speed back up on the way back down. And if you look at the symmetry of this problem, I think you can see, sort of logically, that it's going to come into the ground at the same speed it was shot off at. So it was shot up at 100 meters per second. It's going to come back down at 100 meters per second. The only thing is instead of being 40 degrees above the horizontal, it'll be 40 degrees below the horizontal. It's going to slow down as it goes up, and then it's going to fall through the same displacement and speed right back up and come back in at the exact same speed. That being said, let's just show that mathematically to be really complete. I'm going to move way over here and sort of start a whole new thing just to get us a clean page to work with. So we've got velo vertical and horizontal. Our acceleration in the vertical direction is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And the horizontal direction is zero. Again, gravity pulls it down. Horizontally, it just moves along. V1 and V1, I'm going to have to sneak peeks at these guys. Uh, my initial was, is that a 64? Yeah, 64.3 in the vertical direction. And 76.6 in the horizontal direction. And again, one more thing in the vertical direction, my delta D or my displacement is zero. 
Here, in the horizontal direction, I can discuss this first. If my acceleration is zero, that means uniform motion, or uniform in this direction at least. Which means it's not speeding up, it's not slowing down, it's not doing anything. So if my V1 is 76.6, my V2 is also 76.6 meters per second. So that direction's easy. In this direction, looking for my final velocity, I can use this formula. 2AD equals V2 squared minus V1 squared. Now if I reckon, I'll just be a little more formal here. 2A delta D, there we go. Now if I look at this a little bit more carefully, I'm gonna see that my delta D is zero. So this is gonna turn into 2A zero equals V2 squared minus V1 squared, which means this whole thing's turning to zero. V1 squared, which means my V2 squared is equal to my V1 squared. You might oversimplify, I think I discussed this before, but you might oversimplify and look at this and think V2 equals V1. But we gotta be careful, when we square something and we square root it, we have this same basic mathematical problem. The square root of nine could be three, and that's the most obvious answer. But it could also be negative three. If negative three was multiplied by itself, it would be negative three times negative three and give you a positive nine. So when I square this thing and I square root it, V2 could be equal to V1, but it could also be equal to negative V1. And since this object's going up and coming back down, up and coming back down, that's exactly what's happening here. In the initial situation, it's going up at 64.3 meters per second. In the final situation, it's coming down at 64 meters, 64.3 meters per second. What that means then is that the V2 is the negative of these two things. If we go to recombine, 76.6 meters per second and negative 64.3 meters per second. My V here, to get its magnitude I can use the Pythagorean theorem V, I'll call it V total or V final if you want, is going to be equal to uh, 76.6 meters per second squared plus 64.3 meters per second squared, and I'll put the big square root on that. And I, you can punch all that in if you want, but I know the answer is going to be 100 meters per second. You can check it if you'd like. And to get that angle, we'll use tan. This angle right here, since this is my opposite and this is my adjacent, according to this right angle triangle. Tan theta is going to equal opposite over adjacent, which means tan theta is going to be 64.3 meters per second divided by 76.6 meters per second. And if I do my theta, it's the inverse tan of that. It's gonna be 40 degrees. And so I get that my final velocity is equal to 100 meters per second this time 40 degrees below the horizontal. And we can see that below the horizontal right here. It's obviously below the horizontal. So there's uh, an object rolling off a flat, flat plane and a secondary object that's uh, sent up from the ground at some angle.